My next guest, though, spent 30 years working as a palliative care doctor and is now a best-selling author on the subject. Dr Catherine Mannix has now made a new animated film trying to explain what happens during a natural death, which happens to most of us, I should say, compared to some of the newspaper headlines and, and the stories of the more extreme stories of how people die, and is dedicated to trying to demystify death and remove our fear. Dr Catherine Mannix, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I've watched the animation just over four minutes uh, this morning and it's very peaceful and it's quite calm and and your voice is there and you've scripted it and worked with those who've made it with you. Why did you want to put something like this out there in the world? Because I know you've written and you give lectures, but why this? I think this is a really accessible way of helping people with a small enough soundbite and so beautifully illustrated by Emily Down to talk about something that I think people are just afraid to go there in case it becomes unbearable at some point. So rather than trying to attend a lecture or read a chunky book, here's four minutes that's just gorgeous. And actually, I think it will carry people through to the very end, at the end of which they'll think, oh, do you know what? If I've sat at a deathbed, that explains what I saw. And if I haven't done that yet then I'll be ready. I think it's, it's interesting as well because it made me think about death differently while watching it, not least some of the facts I didn't know, which we'll get to. But it made me think about my own, you know, as opposed to I think when we often think about death, if we think about it at all, we don't like to, we put it in a box marked, I don't want to go there until I have to. Uh, we think about those around us that we couldn't bear to lose. But our, our knowledge of what actually happens, the process of dying, is limited. That's absolutely right. And this video has actually been made uh, by the Theos Think Tank because I'm giving their annual public lecture next week. And they have done a piece of research coming out later this month that just looking at public understanding of dying attitudes, what people know, what sorts of things people worry about. And that's uh, in a long and honourable line of polling to try and find out. And they all show very much the same thing, that people are so afraid of thinking about their own deaths that they postpone it. And then, of course, they need to prepare all in a rush. Yes. And, you know, the other thing that I said, when I just want to contextualise, because, you know, I'm so aware, even on this programme, what we've been talking about this morning, you know, there's a great deal of death in the news, uh, especially at the moment with with what people are thinking about and hearing about. But what you're talking about is natural death. Yeah, I'm talking about, I'm I'm calling it ordinary dying. The thing that will happen towards the very end of almost everybody's life, uh, about 10 or 12% of us will die suddenly, you know, in an accident or because something unexpected medically happens very, very quickly. But the rest of us will go through a process of dying as our body closes down that is really the parallel to other bodily processes, giving birth springs to mind. And welcome back, by the way. Thank you. Um, So, you know, we know that when a woman is going through pregnancy and labour, she's having a perfectly unique experience. But the midwives and and the obstetricians who attend those women just see the same thing that they always see. Same stages, perhaps different lengths individualized because it's this person's pregnancy and birth at the very end of life it's very much a similar story there are phases and stages that are recognizable Mm. and what i found through kind of going public with it is that people get in touch with me to say do you know what knowing that helped me to somebody contacted me this morning put it on twitter as well helped me not to call an ambulance when my person was dying, helped me to recognise that what was happening was normal and safe Mm. and we could be there. I've had feedback from people saying, you know, the nurses told us we'd been there for a long time at hospital with mum, why didn't we go home and get some sleep? And I looked at mum and I said to my sister, oh no, I've read a book about this. Mum's breathing has changed, I don't think we should go. And had we left, we wouldn't have got home before mum died. So that understanding that our foremothers knew has become lost as dying doesn't take place at home anymore and has got medically complicated by often unhelpful treatments. So people aren't seeing that underlying process 
and understanding it in the way they used to. And I'm simply trying to replace that lost wisdom. I'm not saying anything new. In fact, I'm saying something very, very old. What is the process when you go? What what does happen? You mentioned about the breathing, but what actually happens? Okay, so it's an interesting thing that it doesn't seem to matter what the illness is. Towards the end of our lives, the process is very similar. And the first thing that's noticeable is just that the body starts to run out of energy. Almost like, you know, when you've got an old mobile phone and the battery won't stay charged. And the charger is sleep. More than food, more than drink. And in fact, a lot of dying people don't feel very hungry. And that's fine. They're not dying because they're not eating. They're not eating because their body is dying. So as time goes by, people gradually need more sleep to give them intervals of enough energy to think and do what they can. And gradually, people become not just asleep, but unconscious. Now, they don't recognize the difference. We we know that they we keep being unconscious because perhaps it was a visitor or a phone call. It was medicine time. We couldn't wake them up. And when they wake up later, they can't understand why you, you mustn't have tried hard enough. So the first important message is that it's about tiredness and weariness. And the second important message is that we don't know when we're unconscious. It's not a frightening mental state to be in. It's a state of not knowing anything. Towards the very end of people's lives, they become unconscious all of the time. And the unconscious brain really only runs one circuit properly at that point, and that's the breathing circuit. So instead of our usual quiet breathing, the brain runs reflex breathing patterns that move backwards and forwards between quite deep breathing that gradually becomes more shallow, and then back to the beginning again, and backwards and forwards between periods of quite slow breathing more rapid breathing, back to slow breathing again. Now, if you haven't seen that before, you might think that the person who is breathing perhaps fast but shallow is struggling to breathe or is panting or is uncomfortable. And if you haven't seen it before, you might think a person who's breathing deeply, slowly, breathing out through their vocal cords because they can't feel the back of their throat anymore, might make a noise and we might wonder whether they're sighing, groaning, trying to speak. So it's really important to help people to recognize that these are signs of deep unconsciousness. This person is quite safe. And then at the very end of somebody's life, there'll there'll be usually one of those slow breathing phases. There'll be a breath out that just doesn't have another breath in after it, which is not at all what Hollywood has led us all to expect. So the gentleness of it takes families by surprise. Mm. Now, if we know that, then there's a lot less to be afraid of than we would think from newspaper headlines. We can't make it not be sad. I mean, it would be awful to think that there was nobody to be sad about our death, in a way. It's the, it's the other side of the coin of having had loving relationships. Yes. But to take away the fear, I think, is the mission that I'm, I'm on. It's very powerfully described. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a really important message because of the research that's done that shows the fear around it and also the lack of knowledge or the knowledge we've lost. Uh, I'm very struck by you talking about our foremothers knowing this and having laid bodies out and had death around them and, and having that experience very much in the home. I, I just wanted to also say about hearing you talk in the animation about hearing being one of the last things to go and that's why people make playlists i am a yeah. big playlist compiler um uh, haven't thought about that particular playlist yet but um or for anyone else but it, it was it's it's really interesting to know that so it's something that's been observed for centuries that people seem to be more relaxed when the right voices or the right noises are around them And let's remember that for some people, the right noise is silence. Mm. Um, I will not want people playing even Radio 4 at me when it's my turn. I think that's fair enough. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Um, But, you know, until recently, we just kind of thought from experience that that was true. So you would see nurses 
talking to people who were deeply unconscious, explaining they were about to move them. Um, you, could, you would see, we would encourage families to talk to people. But just before COVID, some great research came out of uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, mm. where dying people, patients in one of their hospice services, agreed to join an experiment where they wore little electric probes, just like sticky tape, yes. with chips in on, on their scalps during their dying. And the researchers had previously been in to meet them and thank them for joining in the research and to start the experiment by playing different noises to them and recording the brain waves that their brains made in response to that noise being heard. And then during their descent into unconsciousness and during their dying, these noises were played and the little chips on their scalp picked up the responses. The numbers were only small, but almost all of the patients had the same response quite close to death in their brain that they had when the initial experiment was done. So our hunch down the years that the brain still hears seems to be true. We still haven't done the experiments that tell us whether or not people make sense of what they're hearing or whether it's just the comfort of the tones of the voices in the room that's helpful. We certainly know that if people speak calmly and there isn't an edge of panic in their voices, then their dying person is likely to be calmer. We also know that when people come in and they're panicking and a bit shrill, that that sometimes impacts the person, their breathing starts to change. Perhaps they start to rouse a little bit. So that panic is contagious, but calm is contagious too. So practicing talking gently, calmly is really important gift that we can give. Thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Dr. Catherine Mannix, uh, and there's that video on the Theos Tank, Think Tank website, and she's also giving the annual public lecture, their annual public lecture on the understanding of dying at the Royal Society for Medicine on the 1st of November. Uh, many messages just coming in with what you've just heard, uh, very powerful ones. And one says here, my husband died in a hospice but was not unconscious. He said, I'm going, hurry up. He eyeballed me, holding his arms out to me and said, I love you, to which I replied, I love you, and held him as he took his two final breaths.